The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, helping customers make the switch to solar for savings, energy security, and tax incentives. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, we'll be down with the thickness and introduce you to the Heavy Culture Cooperative. We'll be throwing a big family thicknick in Southampton this Sunday. And we'll head up to East Hampton to hear some of the truly innovative things their farmer's market is doing for folks with market manager Jen Krasler. But first, our 413 roots in the Capitol's Hill. You guys sure are keeping things interesting over there in Washington, D.C. with your party. <laughs> I know. Well, but you know what? I think this is good, and I think we're back in the in the mix. Time for our weekly check-in with U.S. Congressman from the 2nd Congressional District of Massachusetts, Worcester Zone Congressman Jim McGovern. It seems over the course of these conversations and your tone over the last couple of weeks that it was becoming clearer and clearer to you and to the American public that President Biden would withdraw from the presidential race. And last Sunday, he did just that. Vice President Kamala Harris has been tapped to run for the highest office in the land. Uh, you've alluded to this already, but is there a sense of unity in the party around this decision? Is there still some infighting about it? I know that the delegates have already been secured, but there is a Globe opinion piece even today by David Schargenberger, who's saying that he thinks that it should have been mean tested if we really wanted to do the right thing for the Democratic Party instead of just going with the easier route, which is towards, quote unquote, unity. What's the tone of the Democratic uh, Party now? And people have a bounce in their step again. And people believe that we have a real shot to win the presidency and to protect our democracy. So with all due respect to the, to the Boston Globe, I mean, President Biden made this decision rather late. It was a selfless decision that he made. And I thank him for his service. But the bottom line is people are excited about Kamala Harris. And it's unusual for Democrats because we wrangle over lunch. I mean, so this is like a, the idea that everybody just kind of came together, but nobody was forced to come together. People genuinely are excited about her candidacy. People understand what is at stake, you know, whether it's, you know, abortion rights or whether it's, you know, how we're going to conduct our foreign policy or whether we're, we're going to combat climate change or, you know, whether we're going to expand health care protections. I mean, people understand what is at stake. And so I'm excited. I am impressed by people coming together. We have a job to do and we have to, and that job is to protect this democracy. And so we, we don't have much time to be able to get organized uh, and to do primaries and you know, drag this out even more. Our convention's in, a, in, in only in a few weeks. And so if people wanted to, they can challenge this, they can put their name in, they can ask for delegates to support them. But I'm, I've been impressed by the fact that that our party, from liberals to conservatives, seem to have come together and say, you know, we have a job to do and, and let's keep our eye on the ball. And the ongoing narrative is that democracy is at stake for this election in November. And one of the critiques that I've been seeing, both from Republicans and from some Democrats as well, is that their vote in the primary didn't matter if they voted as a Democrat and they voted for Biden, that that vote has now gone away and Kamala Harris has now been tapped to run in place. Now, granted, she is the vice president, so it's not yeah, so I, far yeah. off the ticket. I What's mean, your I, take I, on that critique? I, I know. I voted for Biden-Harris. That was my vote. So I, I, I don't feel I didn't have a say in, in, in this. And look, I think what, what President Biden concluded was that, you know, with all the reporting about is he up to the job and can he, you know, can he finish it in four years and, you know, and is he as sharp as he used to be? If that was what the focus of the discussion was going to be from now until election, then he probably couldn't win because we wouldn't be talking about issues. We'd be just talking about, you know, his cognitive abilities. I, and, and I think he realized that as, as much as I think it, it, it pained him to d decide to, to withdraw, but if, if that's where the discussion is going to be, then Trump wins. And Trump can't win because if he does, uh, the implications for our democracy, the implications for things we care about are, are really significant. One of the things that I've been getting calls into my office from, from people who have never really ever been involved formally in politics. Women calling saying, you know, I, I, I want to, how do I get involved because abortion rights are on the ballot. And, you know, this is, we have a chance, you know, to stop this move toward, you know, a national abortion ban. Let, I, I want to, how do I get involved? Young people, old people, everybody's calling saying, like, I, I want to be part of this movement. And I think it's exciting. Um, and again, if we're looking for the perfect candidate, we all have different opinions of what the perfect candidate's going to be. But she's got a proven record. She's a good person. 
She's incredibly accomplished, and the Republicans are scared out of their minds that she's going to be the nominee, as evidenced by the fact that they're referring to her as a DEI candidate and focusing on her laugh and all that kind of stuff, because they don't know what to do. It's her versus the oldest nominee ever to be nominated by a major political party, you know, and they don't like that optic. Speaking with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern, McGoverning with McGovern, now the conversation has turned towards who will be tapped to run as the vice president. Who would you like to see? And if you had to guess right now, who are the Democrats in all your secret back channel meetings uh, talking about pushing forward as the best option to run as vice president with current vice president Kamala Harris? Well, I mean, of all the people that are being mentioned, the person I know the best is Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota, because he was a former colleague of mine here in the House, and he's incredibly effective and talented, and he'd be he'd be great. But I mean, I I, I see Mark Kelly, who I know a little bit. Um, Wouldn't that be cool to have an also, astronaut in the yeah, White House? I mean, that's I'm yeah. just I'm just such an astronaut <laughs> stand that I don't know. <laughs> no, but I I mean, yeah, I, mean, I I you know, but I think all the candidates that be mentioned, you know, seem to be good to me. Um, and uh, But that's a decision she's going to have to make because, again, we have a short sprint from now until the general election. And I think she needs to uh, you know, have a running mate she feels comfortable with and who, you know, where they complement each other. So is it really her decision I, I, or is it going to be more of the, the architects of the upper echelon of the power structure of the party that will decide? No, it's her decision. I mean, I'm sure she's getting advice from everybody and her people are listening and monitoring you know, all the news shows, trying to get a sense for where – you know, where the chatter is, but this is ultimately her decision. Whoever that decision is has to be approved at the convention, but who she puts forward, will that will be up to her. Yesterday, President Biden gave a primetime speech from the Oval Office, usually a, a room designated for the most important of speeches to the nation. What did you think about that speech last night? And did you feel that it was necessary, especially to do it from the Oval Office on primetime television? I, I, I thought what he did was incredibly selfless. And again, po- politicians don't ever, <laughs> ever want to leave. I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the business. And it's, I, know, I know it was difficult for someone like him who believed that he has a lot more to give and he wanted to do it as, as president. He'll, he'll continue to give, but he'll do it in a different capacity. I, I thought the reason why he did it in, that, in, in the Oval Office was because I think he wanted to underline the gravity of what is at stake. I, as far as I don't think people fully appreciate what a Donald Trump presidency would mean for this country and what it would mean for the world. You know, this is about our democracy. It is about our human rights, our civil rights here in the United States. It is about, you know, whether we're going to expand health care protections or whether we're going to take health care protections away from people. It is about tax cuts for the rich versus helping to, to expand the middle class. It's about ignoring climate change if he would become president. I mean, so the stakes have never been higher. This is the most consequential election of our lifetime. And I think people are you know, are coming to realize that. That's why there's so, so much excitement behind Kamala Harris. But I think he wanted to make sure people understood this is this is not politics as usual. This is not your typical presidential campaign, Democrats versus Republicans. There's just more at stake here. It was striking to me while watching it to think about the President George Washington and his farewell address to the nation, where I think many wanted to anoint a king even early on in our right. democracy. But the fact that he had no heirs and the fact that he chose to have two terms and that's it set a, a tone for the rest of the nation that if he had not done that, we could have been a very different nation. So I did have that song one last time from the Hamilton musical where it goes through the entire Washington yeah. farewell address going through large portions of <laughs> President Biden's speech last night from the Oval Office. I won't sing it for you now. Uh, one thing that did strike me, though, is I saw on your social media that you have been critical of the Republican Party for campaigning in places they shouldn't, including the Rules Committee, where you sit. Right. Uh, supposedly, right. there was a campaign video filmed on the Speaker's balcony overlooking the mall yeah. in Washington, D.C., which you're not supposed to yeah. do for campaigning. Right. Was the president's speech from the Oval Office campaigning for Kamala Harris? And is that an appropriate place to be doing that sort of thing? Well, I, 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 I don't interpret it that way. I interpret it as him basically, the president of the United States is saying, I'm not no longer going to be a candidate for the office. I mean, um, you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson gave similar addresses when he decided he wasn't going to run, you know, for president. But I, 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 I took it more as a, you know, as explaining why he, who up to this point was the presumptive Democratic nominee, uh, he's the current sitting president of the United States. I took this as, you know, him basically informing the nation as to why he's making this decision. Um, and also, again, underlying what the stakes are in this election. I don't think he mentioned Donald Trump once in his speech uh, that I can recall last night. I, I, so, I mean, if, if it was a purely political speech, that would that's what you would 
expect to see happen, him ex- making it even more explicit and mentioning the presumptive Repu- well, now, now the Republican nominee. Speaking with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern, the other big news in Washington, D.C. is that yesterday Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed a joint session of Congress. Uh, Some high-profile representatives, including former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, boycotted this speech. Representative Rashida Tlaib was there holding up a war criminal sign while he was speaking. You also decided to boycott and instead meet with some of the families who uh, still have prisoners that are being held by Hamas. Tell us about your decision to, to boycott this speech yesterday. I, I, I didn't want to be a prop for Netanyahu. I, I disagree uh, with him. I, I, I'm horrified by the way he's conducting this war. The tens of thousands of Palestinians who have been killed, the, who withholding food and med- medical supplies, the people who are in the most desperate situation. I thought it would be more appropriate to meet with some of the families of the hostages, many of them who Netanyahu won't meet with, and who are frustrated because they believe that Netanyahu is prolonging this war. And the longer it goes on, the less likely that their loved ones will be returned home. They want a ceasefire. I want a ceasefire. We're going to stop the killing. They want the hostages brought home. I want the hostages brought home. They believe that uh, the food and medicine ought to be going to the Palestinians. That's what I believe. I also met later with some Palestinian Israeli leaders who are talking about how we move forward and how we try to work on a lasting peace. I'm in favor of that. This ties in nicely to a listener question from Josh Jacobson. He says, will Congressman McGovern second Senator Tim Kaine's call for a unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state pursuant with UN Resolution 181? I think we both recognize, meaning Josh Jacobson and you, that Hamas is not the political movement which can or should lead Palestine following the conflict. Would Congressman McGovern be supportive of a unilateral recognition of the Palestinian Authority as the legal and legitimate authority of the Palestinian state? He also says he um, appreciates your boycott of Netanyahu's speech yesterday. Yeah, no, I I agree with Tim Kaye. uh, Yes, uh, I do. Um, And whether we get to that point or not with whoever's in the White House uh, remains to be seen. But uh, I don't see how there is any way forward to get to a lasting peace without a recognition that the Palestinians deserve a homeland. They deserve to live free of occupation. They deserve to be able to determine their own future. And we also need to have a future in which Israel's security um, is ensured as well. People who live in Israel shouldn't have to be worried about a a reoccurrence of what happened on October 7th. When I was in Israel a year ago, February, I visited the areas that Hamas had attacked. Uh, And ironically, those areas probably are populated with the most pro-peace, pro-two-state solution Israelis anywhere in Israel. I mean, the conversations that I had I was there a year ago, February, gave me hope that there were people who were pushing toward dealing with the conflict in a way that I thought was consistent with all the things that I care about, all, all of our values. And that was where, the, where Hamas chose to target. So the one thing I do know is that endless war doesn't solve anything. It, it is not the answer here. And the longer this goes on, the more resentments build, the more Israel becomes insecure, the more innocent Palestinians get killed. By the way, we're talking about Gaza. There's terrible violence and oppression happening in the West Bank as well. So Netanyahu, quite frankly, I think, and this is what the families of the hostages said to us yesterday, he wants this war to continue because that's the way he stays out of jail. Kind of like Trump. He wants to be president so he doesn't have to go to jail. That's not a reason that these people should be leaders. And we need to be more aggressive and and pushing for peace. Uh, and, And that means making sure that our aid is not used in ways that are inconsistent with our laws and our values. Well, I think leaving it on a notion of peace, are you familiar with the activist Randy Keeler, who passed away over the weekend? I'm not sure how well you knew him, but in the peace movement in Western Massachusetts and beyond, he was a huge name. There's an article in today's Greenfield Recorder by Diane Brancaccio. Randy Keeler, a war tax resistor who opposed the Vietnam War, advocacy for social justice, and refused to pay Federal taxes gained national attention, died at his home Sunday morning. I believe it was in Coleraine, although it's listed as Shelburne Falls. After a long battle with myalgic uh, encephalomitis, if that's how I'm saying it, uh, he was 80. His anti-war stance inspired Daniel Ellsberg's public release of the Pentagon Papers, which led to the end of the war. In Randy Keeler's copy of Ellsberg's book, Secrets, there's a handwritten note by Daniel Ellsberg that says, No Randy Keeler, no Pentagon Papers. In your time in representing Western Mass, uh, were you privy to get to know Randy Keeler at all and, and work with him at all? I, I, I knew of him, and, and we worked you know, not as closely as I, I wish we could have. 
but um, you know, uh, blessed are the peacemakers. And you know, and I also you know met with Daniel Ellsberg many times, and you know, he reflected uh, on the importance of the peace activists in Massachusetts. And so, what you just highlighted in terms of the scripture in the book uh, reinforces that. But look, we praise people in this country, you know, who are great on the field of battle, who you know are generals and who are admirals and who you know lead us into war. But we don't spend anywhere near enough time praising the peacemakers, the people who are, you know, who actually are putting it all on the line, you know, to try to get this country and this world to move away from war, to move away from violence. So I will look for that article uh, today. But I think, you know, when you lose somebody like Randy, I think it is, it is, it is a loss felt, not just within Massachusetts. It's a loss felt throughout the country and the world. We need more peacemakers. We need more people that are willing to stand up for peace. We have a bunch of them, by the way, in Western Massachusetts, probably inspired by him. But I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that news. U.S. Congressman from the 2nd Congressional District of Massachusetts joins us every Thursday. If you've got a question for the congressman, you can send it our way, thefab413 at nepm.org, and I'll ask it on your behalf. Thanks as always, Congressman. All the best. Be safe. Later in the show, moving from bugs to flowers and vegetables to farmers markets while innovating cool things at every step of the way. We'll speak with Jen Prassler about her work with her farm and the farmers markets of East Hampton and South Hadley. But next, you can't kill the metal. The metal is way too strong and even stronger when it joins forces with other loud music subcultures, which is exactly what the Heavy Culture Cooperative is doing. And we'll find out how next. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by the UMass Five College Credit Union, offering co-op advantage checking with cash back on all purchases, plus secure debit card controls, all from the UMass Five mobile banking app. Insured by NCUA, umass5.coop. Last week, we mentioned that Western Massachusetts has a thriving, raging heavy music scene. What you might not know is that there's a whole co-op that has emerged to foster and engender more of that community and provide that most necessary and sometimes elusive part of music scene, places to play. The Heavy Culture Cooperative, also known as Thick, is a cooperative owned and operated by workers, artists, and fans and has proclaimed itself Western Mass's home for the alternative arts. Founded in 2022 and made official in 2023, Thick was established with the goal of establishing a music and performing arts venue that embraces various subcultures within the underground arts community. And this Sunday in Southampton, Thick is bringing those like-minded folks together for their summer Thicknick. Joining us to talk about both their organization and their upcoming Thicknick are President Tim Brault and board member and bar manager Nicole Galensky. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. First off, like, why form a co-op for the heavy music scene? And I feel like, again, it's necessary to explain that this is beyond metal. There are more things than, than metal and heavy music. Yeah, for sure. I'd say the reason that we wanted to do this uh, as a co-op instead of just a few people getting together and pooling resources and trying to start start a bar or venue was really with the goals of fairness and equity in mind. A lot of the the folks that came together to found Thick, and then people that became the uh, founding board members were musicians like myself or people that were helping to promote and organize shows or just really dedicated fans. The long and short of it is, is you know, at the end of the night, the people that cared about that scene the most and put the most into it were not the ones that were walking away from that event with any money in their pocket. Uh Mm -hmm. It's an unfair situation. It's not really limited to metal or other forms of heavier underground music at all, but we definitely experienced our share of it. I think another kind of an underpinning of that, having control of our own venue And having the control and operation and decisions behind that be democratically made and transparent would naturally lend itself not to an easy process, but to a fair one. Mm. Tell us about the venue. Is it up and running? 
is the fact that you're having a thicknick indicating that it's an outside event because the venue isn't quite ready yet? Let's talk to the bar manager and board member, uh, Nicole Galinsky. Yeah, so currently we do not have a venue yet. We are looking at a spot that is whole on hold for us. We are <coughs> waiting for our liquor license to go through. So uh, that similar is... story that we've heard all over the place. So we are very hopeful, but <laughs> until that is the case, we are currently doing events at other venues. Do you know where it's going to be? Are you allowed to say? Do you want to say? Yeah, downtown East Hampton is is the uh, location that we're we're focused on now, and we're optimistic. Can't promise, but we're hoping to be open this year if if all the stars align and everything goes well. There's a lot of promoters that have been working at other venues for many years and have just found themselves kind of on the shorter end of the stick. That's a lot of the people that are involved are the musicians and the promoters, and we're just coming together for it. You're doing shows, or like at least part of shows that are currently happening at Marigold and Hawks and Reed, including this weekend. Before yeah. your picnic, there was a, a ska thing happening, and mm-hmm. I, I don't feel like people generally describe ska as like heavy or underground. Yeah, uh, I think it's had a resurgence, (laughs) for sure, from the 90s till (laughs) now. Are we in fourth wave, Scott? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to count it. Oh, man. To some of us rude girls, it never went away. Yeah, yeah. There there definitely seems to be a resurgence. And, you know, historically really tied into and now pretty intermingled with the punk scene. And I think that's really where where the connection is. I think a lot of the, the people that, you know, got this idea rolling and and founded the organization. Happened to be metal fans, and we have that in common, but not exclusively. And we're definitely not going to limit what events we're participating in or booking to strictly metal. Really, just any any form of underground music that <clears throat> that needs a home that doesn't really get booked at other places as often as it ought to. That's who we want to have. We're speaking with the president of Thick, the heavy. Culture Cooperative, THC, C, and board member and bar manager Nicole Galensky about their thicknick and their ska event happening at Hawks and Reed. Are you like a 501c3 or how does this how is this working? Yeah, so the company structure is an LLC, but <clears throat> Massachusetts has an some... H E L L C. I like that. You're gonna burn in hell. But the state has some particular rules and benefits for uh, organizations that are formally run as cooperatives. I guess the the key points are that unlike a traditional company structure where I invested the most money so I have the most votes, Mm -hmm. um, with cooperatives you are legally required to have one person can only have one share and one share is one vote. So uh, there are other ways to invest in the business, but simply being the one that showed up with the biggest check doesn't mean you get to make the decisions. It is a fully democratic process to choose the board of directors every year, to vote for uh, the president and the other uh, officers. There's even, aside from the yearly meeting, there's uh, monthly board meetings that are open to all, what we call them member owners or shareholders. And everybody really has a lot of opportunity to say their piece, make sure that their opinions are heard. And then we we use a very democratic process to figure out what we're going to do. And that said, like, there's still a place for those larger. They can't be donations. You're not technically a nonprofit, but investments. Should somebody see your mission and feel really strongly about it? It just doesn't necessarily buy you more of the company to have your say. Right. Yeah. it, It doesn't buy you any more control of the company. You know, that and being able to kind of distribute the responsibility for running an organization like this amongst a lot of people makes it more complicated, but it's also the strength. Um, you know, when we we started out, there was a group of, I don't know, five or six of us that were kind of toying with the idea. And then when we needed to get a little bit more serious about it to try to acquire a property, um, that's when we incorporated and expanded a little bit to grow to a nine-person board of interim directors. It was, even for nine people, there was a lot of work to do. And one of the lovely things that's changed so much since we went public and started selling ownership shares is that now there are over 100 owners of Thick, and there's a lot more hands to make the work light. 
One of the ways that you can make that work light if you decide to become a member owner is that there are different types of member owners. There's a creative aspect to it. There's a promotional aspect to it. Can you talk about the the breakdown between the the roles and how you get to them once you decide to become a member of Thick? Yeah, there's three categories, the general members, creative owners, and worker owners. I think one of the key points is that within a, a co-op structure, the board can elect to share profits with the owners if, if that's the right thing to do for the for the business at the time. And the way that we've structured ourselves, the percentage that you get of that share uh, is kind of a function of both of which ownership category you're in and how many, either how many hours you've volunteered or worked or how many shows you've attended or shows you've played or done sound for, all that sort of either financial or labor contribution all kind of determines what share you get back when the business becomes profitable. We do intend for the creative owner class and the worker owner class to kind of get a an additional share for their additional uh, contribution to the effort. You've got a membership and there are several ways to participate, especially if you don't necessarily have the membership fee all up front. I know when I go to River Valley Co-op and they ask me and I'm still not a member and it's mostly because like you want a lot of money up front and I don't always have that. But you have options for people who for whom that is also true. Yeah, we do. Um, so we set up a process uh, where you can fill out a hardship application. It's not uh, We don't do a lot of means testing. That's really not something we're interested in doing. If you say that uh, this is causing a hardship for you to be able to, to come up with the money up front, then don't try to poke too many holes in that. But through that process, we can either arrange for uh, people to essentially uh, work or volunteer to work off the cost of their share, or we uh, have received some some donations that we put into what we call the hardship fund to use to cover the cost of people becoming full owners. We really wanted to be careful to not have the economic means that are traditionally needed for owning a part of a business to be a barrier to people participating in this. The idea is really to to grow wealth for everybody, not to try to extract it from anyone. Soon we'll hear about how the Heavy Culture Collective President Tim Brault and board member Nicole Galinsky each came to their love of the louder weighty sounding music and how they seek to bring everyone who shares that love together. And we'll get to see some of the truly unique offerings available at the East Hampton Farmer's Market with manager Jen Grassler. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. So this Saturday, Thick, the Heavy Culture Cooperative, has an event at Hawks and Reed, a Pioneer Valley Ska Festival, and then Sunday is the Summer Thick Nick at Camp John Association in Southampton. There's a, a bunch of bands playing the Ska Festival. Pilfer is one of the ones that I saw. Yeah, yeah. so that was all organized by uh, 413 Ska, and they've been uh, gracious enough to, to let us uh, hang out and, and promote Thick at that event. So who is playing the summer Thicknick then in Southampton on Sunday? So that's just going to be a hangout at the beach. Camp John has its a little beach access to the Hamden Ponds Pond, and we are renting the private club there. So we're gonna have a DJ with karaoke. So like metal karaoke, metal karaoke. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> Someone's gonna sing Holy Diver. Yes. no doubt. Oh yeah, it. is that the big karaoke <laughs> tune in the heavy world? What other big I hits? Mean, Dio's a good one. Dio. Metallica lends itself pretty well. Oh. Judas Priest. Which yeah. ones? Which Metallicas and which Priest? You know, are they like hits of, of metal karaoke? Oh, man. I love this. I, I mean, so Breaking the Law, sure. Oh, yeah. Turbo yeah. Lover. Classic. I mean, I've Crawler. Seen, yeah, I've seen people do Enter Sandman. When I've run karaoke before, like that's one of the Metallica ones that pops out every once in a while. There's a lot more there than you are, think. Oh, yes. <laughs> Someone will probably do uh, You Suffer by Napalm Death because nice. it's uh, two seconds long. <laughs> Cool. I love that. That'd be mine. Um, President Tim Brault and board member and bar manager Nicole Galinsky from Thick, the Heavy Culture Cooperative. Was there a song for you that awakened you to the world of heavy music? I remember being like a kid and listening to radio in the back of my parents' car. And then I think the one that really I was like, I'm growing my hair out and I am metal now was when Faith No More came out. And I was uh, like, yeah. whatever is going on here. I am part of this. Well, what was going on is that it was it. That was it. <laughs> what is it? I it's see it. what you did there. 
Yes, for me, my dad was a classic rock guy, so there was always a lot of rock music in the house, but not as much a metal guy. And what really got me going in that direction, uh, I remember, was my older cousin showing me the Unforgiven by Metallica, and I just wanted to hear it over and over and over again. And that, like, I think I was about eight, and that just set me off on a path. What about you? Oh, you know, my mom had a meatloaf cassette tape that we would listen to as kids and I think that started my love of music as well as playing the trumpet as a child so I, I would say I'm not just a soul metal head I am a punk rock I'm I'm it's whatever I'm feeling for the day but I think meatloaf got me yeah written bad. by Jim Steinman Amherst college graduate oh, wow. yeah yes. and the, right. the trumpet is technically metal it is it I is. mean, it's made of it's metal. It's made of metal. Of metal. <laughs> um, but, like, in addition to that, Nicole, especially because, like, not only are you a board member, but when the venue comes to fruition, you are going to be at the bar greeting all of these people and dealing, I am. dealing with, with that aspect yeah. of this. What's endearing about the local heavy music community? You know, as tough as we all look... They are the sweetest people, the smartest people. I think being in this wild world, we're kind of like thrown into the corner just from being different. But when we all get together, I, I, I think it's magical. I feel like an old man asking this question. <laughs> I, w I remember mowing the lawn, like listening to Master of Puppets, you know, my yes. headphones and my Walkman. And Walkman. Then, then Stranger Things comes out a couple years ago oh, and I they're know. shredding. Mm -hmm. And I like lost my mind. I was like filled with glee and joy. And my now 11 year old wants to listen to Master of Puppets all the time, I mean, which is awesome. That is great. Your, that, your 11 year old is the one of your children that looks like a metalhead. Oh, yeah. Always has. <laughs> hair down, hair down, you know. Next generation. To their rib cage at this point. What are some of the big acts right now that people in the world of heavy music are drawn to that I should go listen to on my drive home. Yeah, the scene is is so huge and diverse in terms of tons of different little subgenres, but Mastodon comes to mind, Gojira comes to mind. Okay, I've heard um, of both of them. Good. <laughs> a little more locally, uh, Converge is really at the top of the like metal hardcore crossover scene they're uh, based in in salem and have been killing it for over 20 years now i'm just going to go by the next month i'm going to see midnight which is going to be uh in boston uh we got rpm fest with a bunch of bands leather lung is a local band castle rat Tower they are from New awesome. York. Yeah, Castle Rat's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah, they're, the they're that, blowing like, up right now. I don't now, want to call it cosplay, like... but they, you yeah. know, they look, they're wearing the medieval stuff. Yeah, for I love sure. That. It's a rabbit hole. Yeah. That's one of the other cool things about this scene is that you couldn't possibly know everything no. about it because there are just so many talented musicians putting together awesome releases, uh, not just here, but, but all across the country, though. I do think for the size of its population, Western Mass is music scene and especially the metal scene really punches above its weight. Are there any plans for Thick to, as a part of its cooperative, start creating space for recording? So we do have um, some of the members of this do have recording studios. There's a lot of different skills and aspects of all of our members and we hope that it will just bring the circle around to recording to we have a set designer so possibly we <laughs> we don't plan on stopping at this one little venue you know one day we hope to be like the vfw but thick in your town <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah they get their acronym you get yours yeah 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 we've had a, tied a lot of talks about lofty long-term visions and nikki's right that you know one of them is having you know, repeating the same process in another city that wants it and needs it. You know, we've uh, we've got a lot of uh, friends and I have some bandmates uh, that are out in Pittsfield that have kind of said like, okay, as soon as you get this figured out in East Hampton, there is nowhere to play in Pittsfield. Do it again. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got we got a lot to do between now and then. We got got enough <laughs> on our plates as it is, but in the long term, we've talked about things like that or even discuss trying to provide housing for our members. There's a lot of benefits through the state for uh, cooperative run housing. Now that we have this, the organization set up, there's a lot of flexibility as to what different sorts of businesses or uh, we could get into or benefits we can provide to our members. And really the only thing that, that limits us, and it's hard to say it's a limit, 
is our charter that it has to be for the, the benefit of the member owners. You could push yourselves further or farther. We figured that out yesterday. Yeah, that's a order, tough one. Like, I still don't remember. Yeah, it's, that gets me every time. It could yeah. be both. We're going to space eventually. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Metal and where else does metal yeah. belong but in space? <laughs> You've heard of the uh, worker-owned cooperative Real Pickles. Maybe yeah. you have gone and purchased some groceries at the Franklin Community Co-op or, or at River Valley Market. But now you can be part of metal future history with the Heavy Culture Cooperative Thick. And they are having some events this coming weekend at Hawks and Reed where they will be on site for the Ska Festival and their Thicknick is happening on Sunday in Southampton. You can find out all the comings and goings of Thick at theheavyculture.coop. And we have been joined today by the president of Thick, Tim Brault, and board member and bar manager, Nicole Galensky. And just throwing out there that if you're worried about like the makeup of this, they've got at least one town council member. Yeah. Or city council member. <laughs> That's uh, right. Who's part of their board. So like- Are we going to out them? Thomas Peake's picture is on the website. Yeah, it's no secret. It's no secret. <laughs> no. Tom's a metalhead and his background is actually, he studied economics and learned a lot about co-ops in school. So when the idea was thrown out like, oh, maybe we should make this into a co-op, like his eyes just lit up and it's like, a heavy metal co-op? Why didn't I think of that? This is the greatest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Thomas Peake is such a solid dude. <laughs> he really is. Well, thank you, Tim Brawl and Nicole Galinsky, again, for coming in and talking to us about this is an amazing concept, and you can find out more at theheavyculture.coop. Thanks so much. Thank you. Keep it heavy. Keep it thick. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you can find more information about the summer picnic at heavy the heavyculture.coop and I'll leave you to imagine the air drumming that's happening right next to me right now. Let's go learn about bugs. No, let's learn about farms and farmers markets. Let's do both with Jen Crassler, manager manager of the East Hampton and South Hadley Farmers Markets. And a floor and a farmer at Flora and Fauna Farm and a former entomologist. So many ampersands. You're listening to the Fabulous 413 on 885 NEPM. NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village, offering research-based arts, music, fitness, and lifelong learning programs at their assisted living and Alzheimer's care community in Westfield. Armbrookvillage.com. Time for another Local Hero Spotlight with Phil Corman from CESA, the Local Hero folks, and Jen Crassler, who is the manager of the East Hampton Farmer's Market, but also does a bunch of other interesting stuff, including working full-time for that HIP organization called HIP, the Healthy Incentives Program, and a former entomologist. Um, should I just Whoop. tee this up for you? Yeah. What is HIP? What is HIP? Tell me, tell me. Tower power. It's a song, yeah. Well, well, HIP is the Healthy Incentives Program, mm -hmm. which is part of SNAP, um, where you can spend um, money on fresh fruits, vegetables at farmers markets, farm stands, mobile markets. And we talk about that a lot, and a lot of the farmers that we get to meet through CESA and with Phil use HIP and SNAP. SNAP, the federal mm -hmm. program, HIP, the state program, mm -hmm. snapping your HIP sounds painful, but it's actually really good. And gives you more money to work with, too, to get better food in, in your, your diet and your life. Tell us about your transition from entomology into the world of farming. So I started off as an entomologist, studied at entomology at UMass Amherst, and found that a lot of the jobs involving entomology involved killing insects. And I just wasn't interested in killing insects. I was really interested in the, you know, unicorns and rainbows of entomology. Wait, really... unicorns are bugs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they um, live in rainbows? Well, that I knew. We usually call them <laughs> stag beetles, but that's okay. <laughs> I love stag beetles. Those are, are they the cool? coolest? They're the coolest. <laughs> I was really interested in just kind of like playing with bugs. And I just remember one day being confused and a little sad about job prospects and there was a person in charge of the sustainable food and farming department over at UMass who kind of took me under his wing and was just like I know where you belong and started focusing more on pollinators promoting growing native plants and it got me into farming 
now I am kind of like a walking, talking encyclopedia of plants and insects. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get a chance to use any of your entomology knowledge to help some of the farmers in your farmer's market understand that the things that coming through that are coming through their farm are not all necessarily bad? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. I worked for a little while helping local farms, actually in Austin, Texas, grow native plants alongside of some of their crops to attract native pollinators and native insects to kind of keep down some of the populations of insects that were attacking their crops as part of like an integrative pest management system, you know, to kind of like help them kind of do a little bit less of spraying and, you know, using some of the poisons and stuff like that that they were doing on their farms. And once I moved back into Massachusetts. I had a garden. It was a garden that my grandfather had started and got really, really, really good at growing stuff. You kind of caught the bug. I did. I oh. really did. Yes. Oh. I'm not the only one making bug puns. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I resisted saying something when you said that the teacher at UMass took you under his wing because I did en- envision, <laughs> like, the fly. <laughs> No, an old lady who swallowed a fly, perhaps she'll die. We're speaking with Jen Krasler, who is the manager of the East Hampton Farmers Market and former entomologist and now farmer. You're, so are you, is you, are you still gardening in this garden or are you uh, officially farming now? Absolutely. So <laughs> as of a couple weeks ago, I'm no longer gardening there. But about six years ago, I met my now husband and he lives in South Hadley. He had two and a half acres of land. I did not know this when I met him. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. So so we met, hit it off, started dating, and when we got married, I moved in with him. It was a hot mess of a yard, totally loaded with all kinds of plants that were invasive, and we started clearing the land. I started (laughs) taking over and slowly turned it into like this absolute wonderland of native edible all kinds of awesome things and so it, we've turned it into a farm it's called flora and fauna farm we grow native edible medicinal plants and are you bringing your cool things to absolutely. the east hampton farmers market yes, on sundays we are. pace and av absolutely <laughs> What kind of stuff did you have there this week? Uh, this week we had dragon fruit cactus. Oh, so oh. goji berry plants. Cool. Well, these are things that you don't really hear yep, about some, that often in Western Mass. Yep, some sun dried tomatoes, yeah, a bunch of native wildflower plants, all kinds of things. Comfrey, which mm. I love. It's one of my favorite plants. It's a great pollinator plant, but also I love it as like a chop and drop plant for like it's like a living mulch basically i kind of plant it at the end of a lot of my garden beds and two or three times a year i'll chop it completely to the ground and just spread it all underneath some of my bigger plants and it will just come completely disintegrate and feed the soil and it'll grow back completely flower again the bumblebees love it hummingbirds love it also good for wounds and tea I don't want to call them exotic. I feel like that's a a misnomer for for these plants. But like for the non-native things that you are growing, how difficult is it to get some of those things to thrive? Like I would not expect dragon fruit cactus to do particularly well in this soil necessarily. Is there anything that's been really difficult to get to to root itself and work here? So certain things you definitely have to bring indoors. Mm. First of all, I love to talk about plants. So <laughs> when people come to our booth at the farmer's market, we will talk about it for half an hour if you need to. We will talk about all of the care needs of every single plant. There are, however, certain plants that you would not necessarily think could grow in this sort of environment, but you can definitely push the limit of certain plants. If you put them in the right spot, they will come back. If you surround them with like some dark colored stones, you put them up against a nice stone wall or, you put, you know, you put them in a, in a nice spot, you cover them a little with some, some mulch, you uncover them in the spring. You know, you, there's certain things that you can do to make a plant come back and give it its own little microclimate. And we'll teach you how. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's interesting. You're a farmer market manager, so you know the niche that's not being filled by the other farms. But what are the other farms bringing to the East Hampton Farmers Market? So at the East Hampton Market, I have this enormous monster of a spreadsheet <laughs> that I use. It's a, it's a monster. I use chat GBT to help me design this thing, this uh, monster. <laughs> Interesting. Um, we have... That's how it should be used. Right. It's a monster. We have a rotating list of about 50 
maybe 55 vendors that rotate. Some of them are there every week. So maybe about 15 to 20 vendors that are there every week. That's our core vendors. It's mainly the farms. So we have like Park Hill Orchard who brings things like fruits. Um, We have Song Sparrow Farm. They bring gluten-free baked goods. They bring all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Whale Rock Farm brings tons and tons of beautiful vegetables every week. Lovely Farm brings microgreens. We have Mayval Farm who brings beef, cheese, milk. She makes these delicious, delicious chocolate chip cookies, chocolate milk. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I'm not even a milk person, but that chocolate milk (laughs) is to die for. (laughs) Underline Farm brings chicken from, like, right down the road. Best chicken in the world. (laughs) And then we have you know, a bunch of other vendors that are there on a rotating basis. I'm always curious to hear from a farmer market manager. Here you have a chance you're sharing this with a wide audience. What would you say to someone who's never, ever gone to a farmer's market? Why should they go? There's so many reasons. First of all, before you even wake up that morning, your farmers are up picking the produce that you're going to purchase that morning. It's not being shipped across seas, across borders. It is super duper local. Second of all, the money that you're spending at that market is getting spent locally. You are supporting people that live and farm and have businesses in the community. You're not spending it at Walmart. You know exactly where that money is going. You're meeting the people that you're supporting. You can pick up a coffee, have wonderful, amazing conversations with the vendors, talk about how to cook the vegetables, how to use them, learn about new veggies, learn how to grow them. I leave with so much more knowledge every single week than when I arrived. It's not just grocery shopping. It is a whole experience. Jen Kressler, not only are you a farmer, not only are you full-time working with the HIP program, not only are you managing the East Hampton Farmer's Market, but do you also manage the South Hadley Farmer's Market as well? So you're Mm -hmm. managing two farmer's markets? Yeah. When does that one happen? (laughs) East Hampton is Sundays, right? Yep. And the South Hadley Farmer's Market is at Buttery Brook Park in South Hadley every Wednesday from 2 to 6. Buttery Brook. It's been a while since I heard something as New England as Buttery Brook. (laughs) (laughs) It's the most adorable little park in South Hadley. It's such a beautiful place. What are the differences between the East Hampton market and the South Hampton market, either from your perspective or what you see in each of the markets? They're so different. South Hadley, right? (laughs) South Hadley, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're so different. So East Hampton market is huge, first of all. It's huge. It's in a parking lot. Right. It's well established. It's right it's behind there. City Hall. A little more centrally located. It's an, it's kind of walkable. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people live and work in that area. So it's more walkable. It's big. South Hadley Market is located in a park. You definitely have to drive to it. It's more of like a, you have to know it's there. This is only the second year it's in existence. Mm. It's a little smaller. It's a little slower. It's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still representing as your farm at that one, too. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And uh, you were sharing with me that this coming Sunday at the East Hampton Farmer's Market, there will be WIC coupons that are going to be distributed. Can you explain how that works? Both markets accept the WIC and senior coupons. The WIC coupons, WIC will be at the market this Sunday, the 28th, from 10 to 2 contact your local WIC office to sign up for it. It's like a first come first serve type of situation. So you want to contact them as soon as you can. So you can do WIC and SNAP and HIP if you qualify for all that sort of stuff. You can have all the acronyms and SNAP match. Uh, Is that a federal program? That is not. That is a East Hampton Farmer's Market program. Oh, wow. That's great. What is SNAP match? Yeah. So both markets also do the SNAP match program. A lot of markets do this. If you are a SNAP recipient, the SNAP match program is something where a market raises money through local organizations, stuff like that. You know, they, they ask for sponsorships through banks, local businesses. And what they'll do is you'll use your SNAP to purchase stuff that you normally could use SNAP for, and they will match up to a certain amount. So you spend $10 at the market, and they'll give you an extra $10 to purchase food at the market. In East Hampton, we will match up to $10. And so the different thing about the East Hampton market is we will match up to $10, but our match portion, we will allow you to use that match portion for anything at the market. So we want to support all of our vendors. And we also believe that like you're already getting SNAP to purchase food. 
and we think that you you should be able to buy something nice for yourself. If you want to buy a nice pair of earrings at our earring vendor, or you want to buy a nice bar of goat's milk soap, or you want to buy yourself a nice house plant, you can do that. Or you can decide to use it for a meal at the food truck, or you can buy yourself some extra zucchini. Whatever you want to do with that extra set match, you can choose for yourself. Bread and roses. Yep. All right. I, I haven't asked you this question. Ooh. Let's see how it goes. When you were <laughs> eight years old, did you think you would become a bug advocate, farmer, run farmers markets, and help others access food despite their lack of resources? Bug advocate, yes. No to all the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Always love the bugs. Yes. <laughs> Jen Kressler is the market manager of the East Hampton Market, the market manager of the South Hadley Market, a farmer for Flora and Fauna Farm in South Hadley, and works full-time for HIP, making sure that our neighbors in Massachusetts can take advantage of the Healthy Incentive Program. And Phil Corman from CESA, who are the local hero folks who have introduced us to Jen today. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really wish that we had asked Jen what her favorite bug was now. Well, what was the one that you guys both loved? Uh, the... Stag beetle or like rhinoceros beetles. Does that mean that they pay for their own way if they go out to um, dinner? The stag beetle is that or like? Is that what that? Know. Is that what going stag means? At, sort of. I forget. Kind of. No, but they're like all, like their carapaces are all shiny and they have giant appendages. Sounds it's great. Gross. <laughs> Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, instead of welcoming a singer, songwriter, or a classical musician, a rock band will welcome a rock and roll chorus. Rock Voices will celebrate the music of Queen this weekend at the Academy of Music in Northampton, and we'll hear from and about this 100 plus member valley based community chorus. And instead of a wine Thunderdome, we'll take you to Berkshire Mountain Distillers. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413. Woo!